The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So we're going to come back again today to blockchain economics. A lot of what we're going to talk about today, while again anchored in uh, the readings, will also be uh, relevant as we now turn to sort of uh, after SIP week to, to Act 3, when we're going through use cases, but also hopefully relevant as you're starting to think, okay, what about this final project and so forth, and what do, what do we need to do? Um, uh, five or six of the groups have come in, uh, either as an individual person or teams of three or four have come in and sort of bounced ideas off of me. So I want to thank all of the groups that have come in because you've helped me also organize some of my talking points for today as to what we're going through. Uh, and those of you who have, haven't come in, uh, uh, feel free to set things up if you find it helpful. It's not mandatory. Um, uh, but you can also thank the six groups that have come in because now I've, I'm trying to anticipate your questions as well um, uh, uh, along the way. Um, so. Uh, the overview, of course, uh, our reading and, and, and study questions will cop through. There was the le letter to Jamie Dimon, so we're going to kind of dive into that one a little bit. Um, I, I found it interesting when I read it about a year ago, and then I thought, why not throw it into to the mix here. The uh, McKinsey report, which again, I've found this to be true for years, it's not just this class, that you can find some consultant that's put a generalized paper out, it does sort of just skim the tops, but you're getting a sense of how they're trying to, you know, gin up business. Their business model is to write some of these reports, and some of you are going to go into consulting and maybe even write these reports at some point in time. But it's often a good way to see what I'll call just a survey, a topical survey, and how folks think about things. Quickly, a little bit on potential use cases. In the heart of today's discussion and kind of the heart for thinking about the final projects is how to really assess the cost and benefits of any potential use case. So um, I'll, I'll skip through the study questions, but uh, th these these were the key. I didn't see anybody go in the discussion board. I kind of looked. Did you see anything there? No. All right. We did set it up. Um, uh, but what are the potential benefits, and how do you assess the cost of trust? Um, and that is going to be true in every single um, uh, project you look at. And if you take anything from this class, it's it's this core critical reasoning of like. Uh, and I hopefully, after the Rabini paper last Tuesday, uh, we're going to come out of the doldrums and we're going to pull back out of the minimalist side and a little bit get more in the middle. I might not get a lean out of the minimalist side, I don't know. But um, it's interesting. Some groups come in and I find the three or four people that are sitting there, I ask, and, and even amongst the group, there's somebody who's a maximalist and somebody who's a minimalist. So um, I, I, uh, I think we're being successful that we're not going to come out all in the same place. Uh, um, so, uh, of course, since we're going to talk about the readings, let's jump through. Uh, a letter to Jamie Dimon. Anybody want to tell me what you took from, from that letter? I, mean, I really love this article. It was my favorite reading so far. Oh my gosh, 12 <laughs> classes, all right. Um, um, I thought that he did a really great job of stripping some of the hyperbole, both the maximalist and the minimalist, you know, hyperbole surrounding this out of it, to lay down really what it is and how, a very clear explanation of how it works. And then also uh, the note of caution to see these are the dimensions around which you should, you know, you should wait till you put a verdict. But these are the reasons why, you know, there's potentially big implications. And who so. wants to add to it? I'm, I'm going to hold. There was a hand before Aline. Uh, yeah, no, I actually was going to say something similar, but I thought I thought he highlighted a lot the trade-off between trust and the decentralized uh, 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 properties of blockchain versus the cost you must be willing to pay. So and I, remind me your first name. Leo Lander. 
Leonardo. Leonardo. All right, Aline. I agree with both of them. Also, very good, good uh, writing and style. Uh, one thing that I didn't like is that at some point he, he raised the question, well, who needs sensor surface resistance? Because it seems like this is the only benefit of these decentralized applications. And he didn't answer that question, actually. He just gave like two vague, broad answers, but didn't answer that question. Right. So I think that's a really good question. Who needs this stuff anyway? All right, all right, all right. Uh, censorship resistance, we're going to come back to it, Stephanie. Yeah, so I actually, I thought censorship resistance was also one of the more interesting parts of this letter because to me, when you like read through what they highlighted that Jamie Dimon had said, like one of the things was like people who use Bitcoin or like you know blockchain are criminals, and I didn't find that his like focus on censorship resistance really rebutted Jamie Dimon's argument. Um, so, so um, uh, short. Oh, I think the censorship uh, resistance is really interesting in a way that now I can actually understand why we spend so much time and energy on trying to understand public policy. Uh, why is public policy such a, a big thing uh, in response to, um, to, to decentralized apps? I think this is a key question. So I, I think of... I just wanted to bring up, like, well, I mean, I definitely agree. And because that was one of Diamond's points, that like, well, yeah, if you're a criminal, like, this could be useful. And then he talked about how, well, it's worse in a lot of aspects except censorship resistance. But I think the analogy he used was, like, the rise in encrypted messaging um, that has just become, like, it wasn't really predictable that that would be such a big thing. But now that's found use cases in, in the world. Right. So, so uh, it seems like people really like the, the writing, not just the style, but that it was took on and, and had a balanced approach. But you're highlighting, wait a minute, he, he, he ends with censorship resistance, but then doesn't take it the next way. Like, what, what does that mean? And so I think we're gonna try to tease that out a little bit, but I think of it as in two ways. It's the individual. Any one of us could be blocked from doing something. We could not get a service. We could not uh, be allowed to take credit if somebody's allocating credit. Um, Think about Uber, if Uber was censoring, we can't get a ride any longer. I mean, how many of us rate everybody a five when we ride our Ubers because we think, well, maybe they'll, they'll pick me up. If I rated everybody a three, maybe they'll censor me. Um, I don't know, but maybe you all give more legitimate feedback. I just hit five. <laughs> um, so it's the individual censorship, but I think of it as a second thing also, is barriers to entry, a commercial, more broad market barrier, and that in some ways the blockchain technology might allow to um, build something where uh, incumbents already have barriers to entry. They might have used public policy to get the barriers, by the way. They might, they might have regulatory barriers a, as well. Um, so, but more specifically, he did define, it was kind of interesting, crypto assets. And, and he was one, um, the, 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 I'm trying to remember the gentleman who wrote it because it was on chain. It was the head of chain. What's that? Adam Ludwin. Adam Ludwin. Um, but but he, he too said, let's not use the word cryptocurrency, let's use the word crypto assets. They enable a decentralized application. And that was a key thing he was trying to say to Jamie Dimon. It depends on how much you believe in decentralized applications. If you don't see a value in decentralized applications, uh, Lubin, is it? Lubin said, all right, I get it. I'll agree with you, Mr. Dimon. But there is a benefit for decentralized applications uh, and a mechanism to allocate resources to a specific organization. So some incentive way, some way to, to allocate resources. Um, I would say this, we've studied money a lot this semester. Uh, the medium of exchange, unit of account, store of value. But it's also possible that these crypto assets have some other benefit, that they're not really truly competing with the US dollar or competing with the euro but maybe they're competing with, who's my friend who's the gamer over here? Skins. Yeah. What's your name again? Mike. Mike. I'm going to be always looking to my right for the, Perfect. but, but, but they could be, it could be an incentive and, and be competing with skins in a sense. Um, and so I took that, 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 that 
uh, Mr. Diamond, don't think of it only versus the euro or the dollar, because maybe you're right. But it could have something to do with decentralized applications. Um, Kelly. I'm kind of mad that Bitcoin is capitalism still, you should love it. <laughs> that you should still love Bitcoin and capitalism. And that the banks aren't going away. They will probably still have banks. I think it's incredible that he doesn't use the word blockchain till the very end, you know, to asterisk and say, you'll notice I didn't use blockchain. Right. And that is yeah. a kind of genius way to kind of separate. Also, All right. uh, I'm not as genius as him because you know the whole course is called blockchain and money. <laughs> oh well. Um, so, what are decentralized applications, at least in this write-up? Or, or uh, anybody want to? Kelly. Basically, just says it allows you to do what you do today, but without like the trusted party. All right. So you don't need a centralized trusted party. I mean, that's, the, that's what in the 1990s so many people tried and failed with. In a sense, the internet became uh, this way to, in a decentralized way to distribute packets of information, even though there is centralization on the internet as well, as we discussed Tuesday and so forth. But uh, this decentralized application. So in this context, he was using it broad than just something built on top of Ethereum through smart contracts, because he even said Bitcoin was a decentralized application. So he was using it in the broader context, not in what some people call dApps. But a new model for creating, financing, operating software. And this is what Christian Catalini wrote about as well, that it might be that there's a new way to finance a software development. Maybe raise some money for the file sharing before you have the file sharing. Might be an incentive system as well. Um, and then he talked about two structural trade-offs from the design. Now, this design, this blockchain design, has a lot of complexity. It has a lot of additional cost, whether it's mining cost for proof of work or some other cost. Um, to basically secure the data, and so there has to be a trade-off. And what can kind of pull you out of the minimalist end of this is whether there's some benefits as well, and we're going to chat about that in five or ten minutes again. Um, and then the censorship resistance. These are my words, uh, not his. I really do think it's the individual censorship, but also what I'll broadly call the market. Are there barriers to entry in the current system that are in essence are censoring economic activity broadly, not individually. And I think uh, though that was not how he defined it, and I agree with Aline, it would have been great if he had written a few more paragraphs or another page. But it, I think it's not just the individual, it's some barriers to entry for whole market structures. Um, and often centralized institutions, because they have such a networking effect, um, it's hard to, to, to break in when, when somebody's basically the hub of a hub and spokes network for almost anything. I mean, how do you topple Facebook at this point in time because it's kind of, it can, you know, censor other market activity as an example. So then we had the McKinsey report. Anything that people took from, uh, you know, yet one more survey paper? <laughs> that you've had, um, Akira. It's just because I can see your name on the board there, you know. Yeah, well, uh, from McKinsey report, I found the uh, use case, how use case should be assessed. And uh, one thing I found interesting is the uh, switching cost, because the incumbent financial institutions have to think about not only the uh, um, uh, benefit of the uh, cost reduction, but also we have to think about switching cost uh, right. existing infrastructure, a uh, lot <coughs> of the uh, effect on the people working on. So, so Akira has raised a very important thing about switching costs, and we wrote about this, even though I'm not detailing it again, in the joint paper that Simon Johnson and Neha and, 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 and Michael and Jonah and I wrote that you've you now, this is the last time, it's the third time you had to come back and supposedly 
read a little bit more of the Geneva report, but we talk there about the switching cost as well. And, and by the way, to Aline's question from Tuesday about interoperability, a lot of switching costs relate to interoperability. If you're an institution and you're thinking about putting in place some blockchain solution, permission door, permission list, but how does it how does it communicate with the existing network? If the Australian Stock Exchange is putting in a new backend clearing and settlement system on a blockchain, and they are, and they're using digital asset holding, they have to think about, well, all of our customers are currently communicating with a legacy database system, and now we're creating a blockchain system. How, how does that communicate? How does the old system literally move information over into the new system. And, and all of those, from a business perspective, are a question of how do you operate or interoperate with the legacy system and all the network. Because any blockchain solution that you're going to come up with is likely to be replacing some other economic activity and likely you're not going to try to replace the entire network. You're going to be surgical. You're going to decide, uh, well, I'm, I'm not trying to give anything away, Eric, but can I say what you're, you're, you all are talking about in your final project? I mean, you have intellectual property, so I don't know if you wanted to share it, but you want to say what you Can you elaborate a little more, a little more in, in, in the point we're discussing with kind of well, so Eric's group and, and Brodish and Catalina and Ross um, are talking about maybe doing a permissioned blockchain uh, application for credit reports. Not credit reports for the commercial side, but consumer credit. Basically, a, 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 an opportunity. Uh, uh oh, uh -oh Alpha, are you competing with them? Did I just. No. no. Okay. <laughs> All right, maybe you are. So I, I shouldn't say much more. No, it's all right. But uh, I won't say any more. Maybe it would be interesting to point out that uh, the fundamental, uh, or, or one of the interesting things that comes up from the discussion of the topic we're engaging is that uh, how to approach block, a blockchain solution from, from an entrepreneurial um, perspective. Because if you're selling that, uh, if, if Going back to the to the um, letter to to Jamie Diamond, Jamie Diamond uh, reading, we're we're replacing we're trying to get rid of intermediaries who are getting you know economic rents, and with a different kind of paradigm that justifies the costs of using a blockchain approach to 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 promote decentralization. But from an entrepreneurial uh, point of view, you would end up trying to get some uh, benefit from that kind right. of implementation. Right. So you don't want to replace intermediaries with another intermediary. Mm -hmm. So you would have to be a kind of really creative in terms of how to come up with a really lowering costs and gaining some profits in the, in the process. So Eric's raising that if you're just replacing one intermediary with another intermediary, will you be successful as an entrepreneur? Yes, if you're providing a better service or a lowest, lower cost structure, or lower economic rents. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, you know, doubt yourself. I would say we might be able to do it. In your use case, and I I'm, apologize, I'm using maybe it's multiple use, maybe there's two or three groups thinking about, there's a lot of market power right now, and thus a lot of economic rents, but a lot of market power and economic rents in credit reporting. Equifax, First Union, and others earn a certain fees for all of those FICO scores. You know, we're all, in the US, we use, use this. If you're getting a job, somebody runs a credit report on you. If you're buying an automobile and taking out a, an auto loan. I mean, it feels like each of us probably have a credit report pulled on us multiple times a year. Uh, sometimes we don't even know it. Um, but back to interoperability and switching costs, just to pull it all together, how could you convince the commercial banks to use, uh, I'll call it Eric's project, I mean, it's four people, but how could you uh, convince all the banks to use their project? And how about all the auto dealerships on the other side 
who right now are very comfortable using First Union, everybody's probably paying a little bit extra, and there's a fat market power economic rents, but, and so that's part of the switching costs that Akira mentioned. And, and to the interoperability, I believe they'll be more successful if they don't try to completely uh, change how data flows. That at some point you need to know that you can't be successful by biting off too much all at once. I'm sorry, Catalina. Uh, but I was going to say that precisely that is one of the points that McKinsey raised in the paper and is like, uh, it's not changing one intermediary but four other. Mm -hmm. But actually what they say is that it's going to be more successful for, like blockchain is going to be more successful in the permission than in the permission less because the incumbents are more willing to work on the permissions network than in the permission. In essence, Catalina is saying you might be more successful uh, not trying to disrupt the entire community, whatever that community in some ecosystem, some business community. Uh, uh, and, and do it in a permission versus permissionless. But we're, we're going to play with that a little longer. Kelly. I feel like they like that they address the timeline of where the strategic value is. For example, they said currently the best way to like reap benefits from blockchain are to focus on this, this, and this. And then they say, like, however, feasibility at scale, they say, is probably three to five years away, exactly what you've been saying. So. Oh, my God. We could both be wrong. Right. Um, Jack. Uh, something else I found interesting, there's a lot of talk right now about robotics in supply chain using blockchain. And the McKinsey report kind of touched on how, like, no matter how secure the blockchain is, when you start involving actual real products and assets, like, it can be completely corrupted just even if the blockchain fully works. Right. And it's also, it's interesting. I think, Jack, if I can pick further on that, when you have something on the blockchain, even if it arguably should be there, it's a property right and so forth, but it's an off-chain asset. It's not just a digital asset and secured and verified on a blockchain, but it's in supply chain, it's often an off-chain asset and often a physical asset. Then it, there's, there's additional challenges. I think there's some really interesting use cases, but it, 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 it's, it's a little bit of a different place. James, and then I'm gonna, yeah. Um, so uh, they, McKinsey sort of defines a blockchain, and, and they point out doesn't have to necessarily disintermediate to generate value. And it's kind of, I thought that was an interesting uh, intuition. Don't always think that you have to disintermediate to generate value. They might be right or they might be wrong, but you might, you might actually still end up with something that's kind of, it, it, uh, as, um, did Catalina say it, or I can't remember now who said it, but they also said they gave a time scale. You know, short-term value might be predominantly, or Kelly did, sorry, um, three to five years away. Uh, how to capture value. Uh, be pragmatic and skeptical, but you need to go down to a granular level. And that's also what I'm going to ask you to do in the, in the final paper, is really to kind of Challenge yourself, challenge your group to go down to the granular level and say, wait, what transactions are we actually going to change the flow? What ledger system might we shift? And even though it's kind of the, the back office and to some people you might say, oh my God, that's kind of the boring side of business. But that's really what blockchain's about. It's a database and ledger management system also. And to be successful, you have to kind of get down to that granular level um, and, and, and figure it out in terms of whatever that current ecosystem is or the regulatory system. And um, they said it's particularly valuable uh, uh, in low trust environments. And that could be where currently we can't trade directly and you've created a new way to go do peer to peer. Um, or where there's not currently a central intermediary. I mean, you can go right at it. You could be like this bold group that says, I want to take on TransUnion. <laughs> I want to take on Equifax. That's, that's something which is a central intermediary right now. 
but it is correct. We're not really trading directly. It's not like when I walk into the auto uh, shop uh, or the, to buy a car and I'm going to take a loan out that I can transact. They, they want to validate that I can pay back that darn loan. Um, so, yes. Plus two points, particularly the fact of where you're, um, you know, where you can't trade directly now, but there's a lot of trade happening where there, you know, where you don't have an intermediary, but some sort of intermediary would help. I couldn't help but think of like ag markets in very remote you parts. Say of ag, like agriculture, agriculture yeah. markets in like very remote parts of the world, where actually being networked and precisely there's no trust, like. You know that kind of environment exists, so I, I like a use case right. for that would you know it streams like uh, remote parts of the world where internet is there, but not necessarily financial institutions or right. regulatory right. environments. And there are many parts, particularly in the third world, that are still unbanked. I mean, I've said this to statistic before, but the World Bank report on on the bank. The banking in 2017, half of sub-Saharan African was still unbanked, but half of that half has mobile phones. So it's it's just now those gaps might change, but then it will move. Yes, they might have a banking account, but it will be not something they can really do what what agriculture. Um, so two opportunities. I'm going to come to the question is like. Do you go head on against a central intermediary and use this technology to do it better? Look at that, I should turn this off. Um, the, uh, head on against a, a central intermediary or some market structure that has no really core intermediary, but it, you can build a better kind of trustless peer-to-peer uh, -peer network. Yeah, and you think the article, it says that when it comes to permission, private permission, uh, architecture of blockchain, it's highly likely to be more scalably. Why is that? Can you explain? Highly likely to be more scalable, yes. So permission blockchains, by their, their uh, they've made a trade-off. So Nakamoto's paper comes out. For a few years, people don't really notice it. But then... Uh, um, it starts to get some lift, and folks are looking at it in 2013 to 2015. And the financial industry uh, starts to think about this and says, this actually is pretty interesting. We're not sure what it's going to do, but we're pretty interested. And they get attracted to it because it might be a way to move data around. It might be able to literally lower the cost of the back office. Many banks keeping the same set of records. Um, I have an equity trading business. You have an equity trading business. We both have to confirm and, and, and correct those records, but we keep full databases. What they found attractive was real, but then remember, Bitcoin can only do seven transactions a second. So all of those challenges of scalability, privacy, security, um, uh, led them to think about, was there a way that we could toss, literally toss some of the technical things all over the side? And, and, and most of them thought, we don't need a native token. We don't need an incentive structure. And if we limit the number of nodes in the network, we can increase scalability and we can get rid of proof of work. So my narrative might not matter, but it's important to understand it was sort of permissionless thing comes along and then they say, it's not scalable. What can we toss overboard and make it scalable? And what they tossed overboard, they didn't even feel they needed the native token. And they tossed overboard proof of work consensus and had a club deal in, in, in the Australian stock exchange example, they might only have two or three nodes, but in some of these there's 15 or 20. So why is it more scalable? Fewer nodes and much more efficient consensus mechanisms. But the trade-off is you better darn well trust now those 15 or 20 nodes. And when we talk about 51% attacks, you could, you could revise a whole permission blockchain if those 15 parties wanted to. Um, now, some people say, well, you could just do a hash function. Remember that whole hashing? 
you could do a hash function of a whole permission blockchain once a day, once a week, once an hour, and store it somewhere else. In fact, you could store the hash of all of that on Bitcoin. You could, you, you could use a ledger like Bitcoin and just store, store it there. So there's some feedback loops. But does that help give you a sense? I was also just going to build on that. So, so the, the power of a permissioned blockchain is that unlike Ethereum or Bitcoin, it's not public, right? So there is no public ledger. Um, you can make it public, but it's permissioned, not permissionless, because you need to have the trusted entities in this network. So um, this can also be, uh, you could say, a, a, a feature, not a bug, when it comes to scaling, um, because essentially you only grow you, you control the scale, so you, you control these nodes. Um, and then, like mentioned, these, these nodes are, are only relevant um, because they are trusted pieces of this puzzle. Um, yeah. Right, um, but I think it's, it's easier to get scale, but there's not enough, or large enough the market to actually make it scale, or make it reach to the critical mass. So. Are you worried that you, there's not enough to get to the critical mass? Uh, and I'm not sure I'm... So I, a permissionless blockchain and a permission blockchain both can be open to public users. You could have millions of people use a permission blockchain, but only 15 have the right to amend the records. So one might think of who has a right to read it, who has a right to write on it, read, write. <laughs> but also, absent even that, it might provide a service like file sharing or some service. There might even be a third list of who has a right to use the service. Now, usually to use the service, you actually have to read the data, but you could, you could partition and say how much can be read as well. Yes, and remind me your first name, I'm sorry. Chuan. 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 Yeah. Um, um, I, I really appreciate your perspective on how do you envision the <coughs> pathway ahead for permission blockchain. The pathway, you said? The future of permission blockchain in terms of its relationship with public chain. I, I mean, do, do you think it would be uh, like a, a path to path, pave the way towards the true decentralization eventually? Or you were just. So, Chuan. So the, 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 another new form of information silos, or it would just become irrelevant just as, as the internet compared to internet. So Xuan's question is unanswerable, but I'll try to give my opinion in 2018, <laughs> and then we'll see, and it's being recorded, so we'll see oh my gosh, how, how I'll do. Um, but the question really is, is what's the relationship for permissioned and permissionless blockchains, um, and what is it gonna be longer term? I think today in 2018, because of the scalability issues and some of the privacy and security issues, the dominant place that the investment will be is on the permissioned uh, side, especially on what's called enterprise applications. The banks, the large institutions, th there's not enough scalability because uh, 1,000 users a day or 1,500 users a day on the big, big apps right now on the Ethereum network. That's just not enough. Um, I mean, you know, beyond gaming sites and some small hobbyist type things like crypto kitties. Um, I mean, it's fun, it's interesting, but it's not truly scalable to, you know, seven billion people living around the globe. Um, but I wouldn't, I, and I've said this to some IBM folks, I said, and they have a thousand people at IBM in the Hyperledger team. So, I mean, a anybody who's a blockchain minimalist, you, you haven't heard this number? I've heard 2,500 of them. 2,500, all right, so it's more than I thought. Maybe no. no, no, so 1,000 to 2,500. I knew it was more than 1,000. I mean, IBM is throwing a lot of money there. Now, they might be doing that to protect their risk. They might be investing even if all those 1,000 people ultimately produce nothing, but they're but I think that five years from now or seven years from now, the gap will close. I think that permissionless systems will always have a lot of challenge about governance, collective action. 
how you have collective action is not just a matter of technical and, and coding and smart scientists at MIT and elsewhere. Um, I think that's going to still be a challenge and there'll be trade-offs. Um, so it might be that they coexist, but I think the gap will close. And you said, well, will it be like the intranet sort of went away and the internet was there? There are some people that believe that. And that might be, I'm, I'm probably not there. I'm probably not all the way there. But I think when the gap closes, some of these permission systems will not be as necessary. Zero knowledge proofs, other ways that come along that, that make it more usable. Yes, Zan. Totally understood. I'm still a little bit skeptical on the permission blockchains. Um, one of the- Wait, are, you, are you skeptical if I can interrupt you and thus it moves you over to traditional databases or skeptical and you're moved over to permissionless open? So I don't know which way uh, is it pushing you? Depending on the use case for enterprises, I think traditional databases um, for the enterprise use case. The reading here, it's, I just, this line killed me. It said Accenture developed a mutable blockchain in which the content of individual blocks can be modified. And that's like, it's a ridiculous statement considering, you know, the definition of blockchain is like anti, this is the antithesis of basically. Right, so Accenture created a, an immutable blockchain that isn't immutable, yeah. is what you're saying. It can be amended. Um, so it's a back door. I can, I, can, I can change. And yet the economics of it is that a lot of times people do want a back door. And, the, and, and the, the challenges, and these are the weaknesses as well, as Noria Rubini says, well, how, why would you create a system where if you forget your private key, lose your private key, or the cave collapses, that you're hiding the private key in a cave and maybe it floods, uh, that you've lost your assets, wouldn't you want a back door? Would be, and, and, and um, but, but I respect you would say this isn't even a blockchain. I'm trying to teach this class in a little bit neutral between permissionless and permission blockchains, but you need something to get out of the traditional databases, and I've chosen at least for purposes of this class. That means you've got to have an append-only log, you have to have time stamping, you've got to have sort of the basis of some more multiple people writing to the ledger, even if it's only three or five. Um, but, but these are not well-defined vocabulary terms. Aline. Why we should stop using them, and this is a perfect, perfect <laughs> opportunity to actually talk about append-only ledgers, because that's actually meaningful, a meaningful notion that's been studied in computer science for decades, or consensus algorithms, which is another meaningful notion studied in computer science for decades, and consensus algorithms on permissionless, on uh, append-only ledgers, sometimes referred to colloquially as blockchain, and then we would know what we're actually talking about, you know, if we, if we use the term and spend some time. Well, I, I, will, I will try to help, but we're only 80 people, and there's like a lot of people using these terms. And when you go outside of this class, or even when you read like an open letter to Jamie Dimon, I mean, of the, of the you know, somewhere between uh, 25 and 50 readings you had t so far this semester, they've used the word blockchain in multiple ways. I'm agreeing with you. You're just asking me not to ever use the word blockchain yes. again? Yes. Oh my God, oh my God. And he's sitting in the center of the class. Let's keep going. Um, so we're gonna study these. This is just this list that we've talked about, but in, in act three, we're gonna come to it after SIP week and start to go through venture capital payment systems and so forth. Um, it might be some of what you're picking up for senior, uh, you know, for the, the final projects, but you know, here, and I, I stress the word potential use cases. Will these all work? Will they be places? Uh, in the non-financial sort of space, supply chain management I put on this list, but it's kind of financial and I wanted to include it. Digital identity is both within finance and outside of finance. Property and asset registries, you can call it finance, but I'm not gonna sort of dig into that a lot in, in, in the rest of the semester medical records, uh, internet of things, and so forth. Um, this isn't gonna be exhaustive. If you come on Tuesday, October 30th, to the, bit, uh, the blockchain dinner that, or Bitcoin blockchain dinner that Simon Johnson sponsors, we'll have somebody doing election and voting. So there's a lot of other uh, interesting applications. I tend to be a little doubtful about the voting because I think 
official sector and governments want something so centralized <laughs> and, and, and that, but maybe, maybe it will be more decentralized, um, but maybe it's only a pend only without a consensus. Um, so, uh, oh, McKinsey, they broke it down into six buckets. They had the re record keeping and the transaction based. And a lot of these are the similar kind of buckets. Um, uh, it, it's just to give sort of a spur to all of it. So accessing uh, costs and benefits. Um, uh, so we've talked about what are, the, what are the benefits? These are the questions that I would be saying, and some of this was in the Geneva report, but rather than trying to tease it out of all of the discussion. Um, here, here are, uh, I, I'm gonna sort of lay out four big buckets as to how I think about this and how I might you know, get your feedback. If you see other ways to look at this, I, I wanna learn from you all as well. Um, and when I say four, this is the first bucket. Basically, what are the benefits of using this technology? Whether it's this idea about consumer credit, or some of you have had ideas about uh, government procurement or uh, payments, or wherever you are, you know, what is the true benefit? You've got to find a pain point. Every entrepreneur always has to find a pain point in something that, that you can be solving it for a group of stakeholders. And who are the stakeholders you're solving something for? And, or if you're a company, is it an internal pain point? Pain point is some constraint to making more profits, more revenues. Or it's a friction. It's a cost and you want to get rid of a cost. Uh, but what is the pain point for providing a good, a service, or making more money? Um, how can you capture the value? As an entrepreneur, if you do something for iliomocenary purposes, meaning you, know, you don't care about making money, I applaud that. That's terrific. You can even hand that in for your final project. But I'm assuming that you're going to be thinking like me, how do you capture value? Not only do something, but also capture that value and, and, and get a little of somebody else's economic rents, uh, if possible. Um, Thirdly, what are the competition doing? What are the competitors doing? Even if they're using traditional databases, how are they addressing the same pain point um, uh, in anything you're doing? And why is blockchain technology? Or as Aline would wish me to say, why are append-only longs and consensus protocols? What is the answer? What is it about append-only longs with their time stamping, with their final settlement, uh, the finality of that settlement. What about that? Or even a full consensus protocol and a native currency. So I'd add a third thing because permissionless would also have an incentive system and a native currency. So what is it about append-only logs, consensus protocol, and a native currency? How am I doing? I love this. You love it. Yeah, right. Talk like this all the time, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Uh, oh, I need this. Um, uh, but but that's the core. And I sort of I talk about it being the, the final project. But this is really this is going on right now. Twenty eight billion dollars has been raised in initial coin offerings. And a few extra billion, three or four other billions, been raised by direct venture capital in this world, but call it $30 billion. But it's starting, it's not ma fully mature, but it's maturing. And a lot of venture capitalists are kind of saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're past the hype stage. What pain point are you trying to address? How are you creating value? What are the competitions doing? And, and why do you need append-only logs, consensus protocols, and possibly native tokens? I just wanted to follow up on that point about the Accenture. You're not going to tell me how to define something? <laughs> All right, Kelly. So, um, the Accenture thing he was talking about from the economy. It's immutable but amendable. Right. So <laughs> we ask ourselves a question like that seems a little bit, you know, it, it doesn't, what, it defeats the purpose, right? So I then ask myself, like, what value is being created by doing that? Is it some, if it's not necessarily for like their customers, where's the internal value lying? 
I don't know what the application was, but I think that in every application that um, we find in this, in, not just in blockchain, but in other applications, you have to ask absolute final settlement. If you can never amend it, if it is truly immutable, what cost does that also make? I assume that in this application, that was too great a cost for them and they wanted a backdoor, a way to amend that which was supposed to be immutable. I, I, again, I don't know that application. Yeah. But that is one of the, the, I think it's a feature of blockchain, but it's both a feature and to some a bug that you cannot amend something. Yeah. It says that one of the benefits was that it allowed different entities involved to draw on the same record. So like, yeah, of course, I can see where that's valuable, but then it also begs the question, like, if you want to change it, then why not just use the traditional database? The Talent Buderan in 2016 uh, helped when uh, the, the, some, an organization called DAO, the DAO, is a decentralized autonomous organization. Thank you for those who... Um, it was one of the largest at the time initial coin offerings. It raised about 160 U.S. million. And very quickly, right in the smart contract, it wasn't in the base Ethereum layer, but I believe it was in the smart contract on top, somebody saw what has later been called a bug. I don't know if it's truly a bug. It was programmed in, in a sense, but there was a way that they could see how to get in there, and they took about a third of the tokens, so the equivalent of about 50 million. But the way the programming worked, there was about two weeks before it actually was truly final. I mean, it was something in the code also that, and that wasn't a bug. And the whole uh, Ethereum community was debating it and Vitalik Buterin said, no, we can't let this happen. So in a sense, they bigfooted it. It wasn't, a, they almost did what uh, Essentia. Now he might say, no, actually it was right at the 11th hour and 59th minute, but because uh, there was this like 10 day or two week period. But they basically, Vitalik Buterin even did kind of what Essentia did at that moment. They forked it then, right? Yeah. Well, I, I don't even know, was it a technical fork because of how they did it? Came right at that, at that moment. Still has the DAO, like still has the, the stolen 50 million or whatever the number of tokens. So that led to the, the, the fork. The majority of the community went with Vitalik rather than what the, the fork happened. So how immutable is immutable if there's a broad consensus? Now that's the back door sense. Um, second, but, uh, was there another hand? Or I'm sorry, Brodish. I think so. kind of to address this point. So, to address uh, Kelly's and uh, yeah, and, Zahn's. and the word blockchain. And the word blockchain, <laughs> all right. So uh, I think when people are talking about blockchain as a term, they are <coughs> essentially referring to a set of potential benefits of this technology. And some of them can be relevant for a particular use case. Some of them might not be relevant. Some of them might be actually an obstacle for that particular use case. So the way it can be thought of is that we have an umbrella term which talks about different potential benefits. We take what is required from that. It could be append only, it could be not append only, it could be consensus, it could be permission, permissionless, whatever. And then we kind of collaborate them and create a solution which is applicable for the particular use case that I want to look at. <coughs> that, that, is, that, that is why even if it is not immutable, it is still a potential use case of blockchain in, in my understanding because we are bringing out some of the benefits of the umbrella term. I think you're, you're correct, uh, um, but I'm, 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 I'm not going to go all the way to where you are. I think you're correct that, broadly speaking, many people are using this term uh, to promote their own innovation, the innovation of their colleagues, and so forth. And, and yet, some want a backdoor, like Essentia, and make it less immutable. And so all of a sudden, if it's like has a big back door and you can amend, is it really an append only log any longer? Um, what I do want to say is in this class, 
um, I am going to say anything you're working on for your final paper, it has to be at least a permissioned or permissionless system. Thus, it has to have a pet. What's that? Not ours. Not yours, but you're going to get there. You're going to get there, Brodus. You're going to get there. <laughs> so as I told you earlier in, in the day, you know, get to yes. <laughs> But, but, but if it's a traditional database, uh, um, you know, that's not, I'm, I'm saying, you know, stretch, stretch your minds, try to figure out something, even if it's got a little bit of risk into it, you know, as to how you get to using append-only logs and even in a permissioned, closed, loose, private consensus, but some consensus, think about whether you use a token that kind of gets to permissionless. Uh-oh, Eric's going to plead his case. I'm, I'm just going to try to quickly reconcile it. Uh, and then I need to keep going. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 those two apparently divergent points. You mean Brodish and Ali? Yeah. Actually, I agree with Brodish. I, 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 I want to, I want to, the, the point is that. He, he from, might agree from with a, you. From a, I kind of sit in the middle because from, <laughs> from, from a technical standpoint, it's true. You have a pin on the log and a consensus mechanism that make up the original um, use case that brought the term blockchain, right? Plus, so, plus a native token in that one. Yeah, yeah. or native token. But uh, to, the, to the point of what happens if you want to change or amend the, the log, then is that really a blockchain? That's, that's exactly the reason why the term distributed ledger technologies came up, because it, to a certain purist extent, it's not uh, an, an append-only log because you're actually updating it from, from a purist uh, definition. That, that makes sense, of course, but then uh, the nature of a distributed database that's not um, um, located in, a, in an internet that governs the updates and, and whatever changes you, you make it, uh, it's the reason that make up the distributed ledger technologies that are blockchain inspired, if you may. So uh, it's it's okay. You you, you can say uh, if you amend the log, then it's not blockchain, right? But it's DLT. I mean, DLT is blockchain inspired. So we can we can keep everything in the neighborhood. Right? We're going to keep this, this discussion and debate going, and it, we're probably not all that far off. It's not about vocabulary. It's also about I'm trying to spur you all to get to yes, even if you're a minimalist, like to think about some project that uses the essence of this and not just inspired. Um, so then what are the specifics of this append-only long consensus use case um, or blockchain use case? So what cost of verification or networking are you actually reducing? Back to Catalini's work about verification cost and networking costs that we talked about on Tuesday. What is that cost you're actually reducing? Which transactions need to be recorded? What accounts or transactions, you might say, need to be recorded on this log? What stakeholders need to be able to write? If there's only one stakeholder that needs to update something, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really entirely sure that you'd be in this distributed, decentralized place. So I, I list these questions uh, that weren't directly in the readings, but I list these questions to say, this is a way to start to get your mind around where this technology, uh, well, however we label it, this technology can help. In essence, does it lower a cost of verification and networking? And if so, which ones? And which ones are you trying to address? Which ones are you trying to dig and basically create value for your startup? What transactions or accounts are you trying to record? Transactions like changing property rights or moving around birth records or land records or, or supply chain, but where's that? What stakeholders actually need to write to this distributed ledger? Because if it's only one party, I'm still a little, uh, I'm still trying to get my head around why the Australian Stock Exchange really needs it. But okay, what, what, what is it that, you know, that there's multiple parties need to write to this, this shared collective state of what, what is there? And then the last one's also terribly important is what's the customer use, user interface? 
and a lot of, uh, of challenges are basically like there's currently we're not in a place where a lot of blockchain applications or distributed applications have great customer user interfaces but uh, 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 that as well. Um, then what are the costs of the transitions? Akira mentioned this from the Geneva report and the other readings, but like what does it cost and challenges? Well, of course, we still have a bunch of scalability and performance issues. We have the privacy issues and coordination. I'm not trying to hold us all to that, by the way, for your, for your final projects. Like, if we're not going to get to scalability for five or seven years, I'm not, I'm not going to say, well, then you all have to write about permission systems. No. I mean, I'm OK if, if you, know, you kind of say, well, <laughs> this is a pilot, and somebody else is going to solve through layer two or ZK snarks or something, these other things. Um, but I'd like you to at least identify what are the issues of scalability, performance, privacy, security, those issues that might hold your Im implementation out? Can a permission blockchain adequately address whatever the use case is? And, and, and how can you actually get jumpstart broad adoption? That's your, your network challenges. How, when you start Uber, can you get a lot of people to use your Uber app? But in this case, how, if I can use the consumer credit I thought the consumer credit idea was really an, a, a neat one. Maybe it could go right at the heart of a lot of market power, but now how do you get all the auto dealers, how do you get all the employers, how do you get the banks to actually say, I want to get rid of First Union <laughs> and I want um, the blockchain and money final project teams, you know. And by the way, just replacing one central monopolist with another central monopolist, a lot of commercial banks aren't terribly excited about that. Maybe you're going to have to give some ownership. Maybe you'll have to give 50% of your ownership to the 20 banks that are now you know, part of this. I mean, there are other ways to build incentive systems. Maybe you put a native token in there, and you give, you give you know, them the native token. You know, so there may be other incentive ways to beat the current monopolist <laughs> And, 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 you know, but, but I, having been around commercial banks for a long time, they really are looking for ways to, um, uh, to, to replace their aggregators in their back office, whether it's clearing, settlement, exchanges, uh, credit agencies. But they are deeply understanding because they, they are pretty ambitious and very good at making money as well. They deeply understand that every idea that's pitched to them is somebody who currently is small but wants to get big and gain market power. So they're also, they're also always thinking about how to ensure that there's a check to slow down your startup from gaining market power 5, 10, and 15 years from now. They don't want you to be the next clearinghouse like uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or Intercontinental Exchange. They don't want you to be the next um, central node of market power. So you might share some of that with them, or you might find an incentive system. Um, and then what are the net? So uh, key questions for uh, companies designing blockchains. This is something from MIT's uh, own Sloan Management Review. It was not a required reading, but I, I thought it was a nice little way to do it. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to record something, track something, verify something, aggregate something? This is in the fall uh, MIT review. What value do you want to capture? Literally, here's a list of the things you might want to capture. Is it about contracts? Is it about permission? But what, what is the value we're trying to capture? And for whom? Obviously, is it for suppliers or customers and so forth? So it's another slice. Uh, by thoughtful people, MIT. <laughs> um, and, and that's a link to the reading if you do want to read it. It was kind of a, it was a well-written five-page article. I even held back on one reading. Um, so the benefits of blockchain, we reviewed this last Tuesday, so I'm not going to go through it again. But again, as you're thinking about this and thinking about which use cases and so forth, think of these costs of verification. Which of these are you really trying to hit? Or is it networking? And I changed the networking a little bit, but 
a token incentive system, which could be like the skins, you know, rewards and affinity identity, could help you start it up or operate it. Or it could be like uh, uh, crypto kitties, where it's like a collectible. You know, so that's another way, way that you have token economics floating in. Um, so this you've seen, I've, I've flipped it around, but basically, do you use a traditional database? Do you think about a private blockchain? Do you think about a public blockchain? If you're over here, I really ask you, Brodish, you got to get to yes. You got to get to here. I mean, you wouldn't want me to just be teaching a traditional database, how do you build something at Sloan, right? This is blockchain and money. Or as Aline wants me to relabel it, append-only logs, consensus protocols, and money. <laughs> And a native currency, but how many of you would sign up? Would you recommend that I list it in the course catalog that way for next September? <laughs> really? No, not really. All right. But if you want to really kind of juice, get to here, right? Put an append-only log in there in some even private permissioned system, or be bold. Try to get all the way to there. Don't stay there. Please. All right, I made my point. James, where are you? Are you there or there? I think we're in the middle, right? The final blockchain. So oh, we're, come on. We're, we're, we're one step ahead of our colleagues. All right, good. <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah, but they're not, they're going to get, they're going to get, they're going to get at least to there. They're not staying there. They want to get a good grade. No, no, I, I really, this is going to be fun. Listen, I, I get it. I, it's not just like any Sloan class where you have a final and everything. I've given you hard tasks. There's $30 billion chasing around to try to find uses. There's thousands, 2,500 at IBM or whatever. There's thousands of people trying to do this, and there's no really true market-wide applications right now. But... That's the nature of what we're doing here together. It's like, and, and, and I'm not asking that somebody actually be able to go raise money and actually start it. You don't have to code it, except for you, Aline. Um, but you don't have to actually code this thing. But I'm really kind of looking like for your, your business savvy. And, 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 that we, and it's more about critical reasoning skills. And, and these four or five pages, you know, pull it off a of canvas and think about it and think about how it kind of fits in with your projects um, or not. Yes? Um, given that, well, the question in previous slides are helpful, but I still find it's hard to decide whether we should really use a, data, a blockchain database from as the traditional database. So is there a non-technical model or framework that we can assess our ourselves between those two? I, I, think, I think of it. <coughs> Uh, I apologize if I go back to the slide, so I'll try not to. <laughs> but I think about it is, are you, are you moving around something of value? Do you need multiple people to be able to help in that, that network? Whether it's because it's peer-to-peer, -peer, if it were the 80 or 90 of us in this room, that, you might be just there right now, that there's a benefit of that peer-to-peer -peer movement of something of value. Or, um, frankly, even back to this, if there's a lot of economic rents, if there's market power in this, if there's big market power and somebody's just collecting you know, lots, that might be your opportunity because this is the technology that can get you there. And you might say, well, I don't absolutely have to have an append-only consensus native currency type of technology but it's how I get to peer to peer. So it might be that that's the way that I'm going to disrupt the party with the big economic rents. Like the letter to Jamie Dimon, if there's a bunch of things about censorship risk. And again, I don't know what use cases you're thinking about, but I think if you don't have one of these six, the verification costs, it's unlikely you need an append only log and consensus and the whole mechanism. But I think if you do have something here, hopefully not just economic rents, but market power, this might be the way you get underneath it by having a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer approach.
So that helps. And, 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 and it, it could be something that has no central authority right now, no central intermediary, and it's just had a jump start something. I think in that circumstance, it's more likely you need a native token. I think if you're trying to jump start a network, and, and, and there's a lot of collective action reasons that will still face you. Some of our colleagues, Andy Lipman and others over at the Media Lab, <laughs> spent a lot of time a year, year and a half ago on a medical records approach with Beth Israel Hospital locally here. And if Andy were here, he'd say, but I still have the collective action issues. How do I get a bunch of hospitals and a bunch of doctors? And how do I get all that collective action to work together to use kind of one database system, if you wish? So I think to get over that collective action issues, you start getting into, well, well this native token might be an interesting way to do that. Right. Um, it seemed that Uber satisfied the things you just mentioned. Like they did. They did. But would they have done it differently if they started in a different era? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's remarkable that they took on and just completely transformed the, 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 the ride share business, the taxi business, if you wish. Um, but there, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident of this. There will be something that we don't envision right now that really transforms the next thing. And as, as my brother said when he said, he said, it might be five and 10 years from now and you won't even expect it. Who would have thought the internet in the 1990s was going to go straight and transform the taxi business? Nobody in the New York taxi business would have envisioned that, which was one of the things that he, he mentioned. Um, so why use blockchain versus traditional database? We sort of did that. I know. You got, you got it, Brodish? Right there? Right there? <laughs> OK. Yeah. I'm having some fun. Um, so the, the trade-offs we've talked about. So these are costs. This is the cost of centralization versus decentralization. We've looked at this slide before. Over time, I think this was an earlier question. Over time, I think what's going to happen is these graphs might have different slopes. <laughs> so it's just sort of like, OK, what if the slopes change? <laughs> I think that the cost of decentralization are going to come down. But that's, that's my sort of more my kind of forecasting, prognosticating. And then you'll have more applications that feel more comfortable over using something around this space. Now, it could be wrong, and it could go the other way. Just saying, you know, and this, this would be more the minimalist side and said, well, you can address some of those centralization costs and it comes down the other way. So it's just a, a visual way to think about what will happen over time with innovation. But I think innovation will pull down the slope, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the slope towards that from where we are today. Because the newer technology, this decentralized, how can we do this? Um, and I think there will be more opportunities uh, around it. All right, so on the 30th, um, we're going to be talking about basically our first kind of area. We're going to talk about payments. We're going to talk a lot about payments. I'm going to take two days to talk about payments, so we're going to kind of lay out a lot about what's going on in finance outside of append-only logs and consensus protocols and blockchain. <laughs> All right. But we're going to have fun because it's, 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 it's what we all live together. And some of you actually live in these countries. But whether it's Alipay and Tension and, and M-Pesa, and, and, you know, so all, all these initiatives. And then how could maybe blockchain fit into it? Um, in terms of the use cases, these are all those use cases that we're going to be doing from October 30th to December 6th. Um, but th this gives you a sense, what I call Act 3. And we're going to really be trying to challenge each other about. And in some weeks, I'm going to uh, uh, give you a heads up. It's going to be a little thin. I'm going to be looking for like who's got really good use cases. If you have something to bring into the classroom that you're saying, hey, this reading list I put together in late August, and by November, it might be that there's somebody that's actually moved something further. So don't be bashful. Shoot it into me in time. I'll distribute it to the whole class. But in a couple of places, uh, digital ID, for instance, I was really like, I thought it was thin. 
I mean, there's the Estonia case, but it's not really, not sure it's a blockchain. <laughs> I mean, so, um, it, it, you know, um, I'm admitting in advance, some of these are, are a little thin, uh, but still good. Um, and the readings for the 30th, uh, the Federal Reserve Payment Study really shows a bunch of information, and you don't have to read the words, just look at the few charts. <laughs> but it's going to give you trends. You're going to really see some interesting trends in there what the best mobile apps are in the global payment report and things like that. Um, any questions on any of that? Um, and then uh, what did we talk about? Blockchain technology can address costs through verification and networking. Uh, the potential use cases, the devil is in the detail. It's true in most things in life, but it really is. This is kind of like natty little details about what transactions, who am I going to try to disintermediate, where am I going to create value, why use a permissioned or permissionless blockchain rather than a traditional database, and, and, and really kind of get some value. Uh, I think you really have to address this question, <laughs> but I, I think there's potential there or why a public blockchain versus a private is a token going to help you jumpstart something. And remember, there's kind of two different types of tokens. There's the broad currency type token. That might be Bitcoin, and they might have won the thing. Or it will be somebody else. And there might be two or three. I personally don't think there will be hundreds of those. Um, but then there might be, in essence, use case specific tokens. Right now we have 1,600 and most will fail. Um, and um, so that's kind of it. Any other queries or anything? Yeah. I think once all the Bitcoins are mined uh, in what, 2040 or 2030? 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, there will continue to be incentives for node operators to continue operating benevolently if there's no further incentives. So the question is, is uh, what happens in, in 20, um, uh, when, when there's very few mining rewards? And the answer is, I'm going to have some fun with you here. I'm going to show you one other thing. Um, uh, the, the, the answer is, Yes, because it's fees. Um, and the fees, the fees in the system, um, I apologize, it's just one thing that I want to show you that's fun. Um, the fees in the system, um, the fees in the system. So right now you can have fees. If you remember how there, there are fees in the system. And instead of having mining rewards, right now they're very small fees. So for every transaction you put into Bitcoin, you can actually say, instead of taking out exactly that the inputs equal the outputs, you have inputs greater than the outputs, and the, 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 the net is fees. And um, what, what is the case there is that um, the, what, the case there is that it, in 2030 or something like that, I think the fees will continue to increase. I think if this takes off, the question is, does it take off? Um, so I just had some fun because this day is an important day for me since you met him. So who, whom is whom? <laughs> I sent this picture to Rob this morning because today is our birthday. And no, 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 that's not it. No, 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 so, who's who? Wait, 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 stripe shirt or, or, or not? 
Okay. Solid. All right, how many striped shirters? All right, all right. How many solid shirters? Wow. So I sent it to Rob this morning, and I sent it to my three daughters, and I sent it to my girlfriend. I said, I'm going to, you know, who, who is this? It's split view there, too. <laughs> I went with striped shirt, but Rob said he doesn't know. <laughs> we were three years old there. And, and um, uh, so that's just a goof around with you. So, all right. Thank you all.